Good afternoon. Thanks for joining us for our virtual conference. And thank you to our sponsors for helping us put on this event. As you know, each track has a raffle prize each day. And I'm lucky enough Thanks to- Thanks for joining us for our virtual conference. Sorry, thank just a second. Thank you to our sponsors for helping us put on this event. Sorry about that. Uh, I'm lucky enough to announce the winner for track two's raffle today. So drum roll, please. And the winner is Catherine Webster. Now you should be getting a message to confirm. So with that out of the way, uh, the speaker for this half hour is Cheerio, who will be sharing her talk about cyber threat intel. She requests that you DM her for question and answer. Cheerio, take it away. Okay, thank you. Uh, sorry, I was in the chat. Okay, hi everyone. Thank you so much for coming to my talk. So it's going to be a very, um, okay, so think of this talk as like the Cliff Notes abridged like bullet point version of uh, Richard Richards Hoyer's uh, Psychology of Intelligence Analysis and, and his other book, Structured Analytic Techniques. So uh, it's, it's basically, you know, a very condensed version of that with a little bit of a Cheerio twist. So <laughs> be, be forewarned. Really quick, I am not speaking on behalf of my of uh, my employers. Uh, basically, all of everything that I'm saying is my opinion and my opinion alone, and it does not uh, represent those of my employers. And I'm speaking on my own individual capacity. So, really quick, what I'm going to go over. Um, uh, if you can't tell, hopefully by the end of this slide deck, you'll see that I love Beyonce. I mean, who doesn't love her? Uh, and I'll talk a little bit about cognitive biases and fallacies, some solutions. Um, I've read a lot of stuff and been exposed to a broad range of stuff, not just tech related. So I'm bringing that to this talk as well. And some crowd surfing, if you're lucky. So as Beyonce says, put a ring on it. Um, I'm saying that you guys basically already kind of do a form of CTI analysis when you're performing uh, blue team related activities. And so uh, I'm just asking that you commit to being a, maybe a little bit more conscious of your analysis and potentially using some of the tips and techniques and tricks that I share in this particular talk. So I think about thinking, like that's so meta, right? Um, and basically it boils down to, uh, this is of course from Richard Hoyer's Psychology of Intelligence Analysis, where uh, he gives this printout and uh, you look at it. And for me, you know, even as an analyst, I was like, oh, like there's nothing wrong with that. I just looked at it with my own assumptions, my own perception and my own experience, like Paris in the springtime. I read it as Paris in the springtime and I completely just delete the second the. Um, so I have to actually like physically like look at it and follow it to be able to get rid of my previous experience with that particular phrase, especially since I love Paris. And uh, so I just get excited and I see essentially my experience and what I perceive it to be. So if I have these issues and I'm an intelligence analyst uh, with a lot of experience in different areas that help uh, being a CTI analyst, uh, like it made me wonder uh, what what uh, what other blue teamers are experiencing and if they have the same preconceived notions with uh, with the information that they engage, whether it's alerts or whatever it is that they're doing. Um, people don't really see uh, stuff based on their previous experience. Another problem is short-term memory. So our working memory, you can hold seven plus or minus two items, depending upon your brain and uh, whatever's going on with this. And so um, 
there's got to be a way to work with the issues related to your short term memory in order to become better analysts. And the other thing is long term memory. So long term memory basically happens through association, some mental models, analogies, and uh, it, it takes a little bit of time, maybe some repetition for some people like myself. Uh, so how do you work with the way that the mind works? And this is something that I'll explore further. Uh, the other thing is experienced analysts have baggage. And what I mean by that is that they have previous experience, previous beliefs, previous ways of performing analysis, especially if they've been to multiple companies or had multiple uh, reorgs and different people telling them how they want things to be done, right? Previous uh, preconceived notions. So there's a lot that experienced analysts have to work with as far as unlearning behaviors, unlearning perceptions, unlearning biases that they might have, which is important, but also sometimes can hinder uh, analysis as well. But I have some good news. There is no substitution for experience. I love you experienced people. So thank you for staying with us and helping uh, newcomers and juniors and, and mid-level people such as myself. So what kind of analyst do you want to be? I personally would love to be like Madonna in this picture here because I love Madonna too. She's freaking amazing. Um, and so thinking about that, I'm like, okay, so like I can just be the regular analyst, like looking through the logs and trying to pivot through DNS stuff and all of that IPs, right? Or I can take it a step further and think about how it is that I'm parsing through the data in my mind. So, you know, I have some assumptions. For instance, if you're looking over, uh, you know, uh, some sort of uh, C2 for malware, you know, there's a lot of assumptions that go with that when you're analyzing data and trying to look at stuff, which could mean that you might miss something. So um, thinking about how you're thinking can be helpful and there are some benefits. So I'll talk briefly about some logical fallacies. There are a ton. Like if you Google logical fallacies, I mean, you could spend a while, like, a while. So here are some of the ones that I picked out that um, that I've at least caught myself on. <laughs> so I'm, I'm, I'm telling all myself, I'm sorry. So this one cause and effect, right? Uh, physical properties versus everything else. So what does that mean? What does that mean to blue teamers and CTI analysts? So basically, if you think about an animal in the woods and they're walking and it just rained and they leave prints, right? That's a cause effect. That's like a physical thing that's going on. Um, another thing is, I mean, I'm sorry, I'm gonna use this example, but the apple from the tree. Uh, if, if an apple falls from a tree, right? You can assume that gravity is somehow involved. Uh, the cause and effect of physical properties. But when you try to extrapolate that and apply that to APT behaviors, or I don't know, let's say the economy and say that, you know, because of X, now the economy is going up or down, like that seems um, like not, not, the, not the best thing to do. So this is kind of what that fallacy is. Another one is analogy. So um, a great example that I found for this is just because the SOC training worked for these analysts, it might not work for these other analysts, if that makes sense. So um, being open to suggestions and not necessarily assuming that everyone fits in the box, right? This is what Diana Initiative is about. At least I believe so, you know, no one no one fits in a nice square box and stay in your stay in your hole. Like different people learn differently. Different people consume information differently. Different people understand things differently. So if you take this particular um, logical fallacy and see how you're thinking, well, well, this works this way. So of course it would work that way with these people. Um, like, just take a step back and be like, hmm, 
is this one of those fallacies that Cheerio talked about? Let me see. So hopefully that helps. The other thing is probability. So um, for instance, in the SOC, right? Let's say you get a ton of false positives. I'm just throwing out an example. And you're like, oh, well, we always get false positives. So, you know, like auto close everything. And so what I'm saying is like, just because there's a probability that there could be a false positive doesn't necessarily mean that the alert that you're working is a false positive. So doing group closes or permanently closing something or however it works within your organization, um, like I would, I would take a step back and be like, huh, am I, is this a logical fallacy involved with just assuming that it's a false positive without actually looking into it? So that's another way. Anecdotal. So this is this is pretty good with pretty much anyone. Uh, for instance, my previous experience as a small business owner, um, sometimes I try, I tend to get stuck in um, a lot of my business experience. And InfoSec is a different industry. Granted, uh, a lot of the business stuff is very similar, um, you know, on and on, but. Um, you know, stepping back and being like, okay, like, you know, in my previous experience with this, I thought it was, um, you know, I would just write it off as phishing or something like that. But then looking into it, it's like, oh, um, no, it wasn't phishing. And it was, you know, a compromised vendor or, or something like that, right? Like, not relying and uh, making my own experience with stuff the most important thing, like being able to take additional information in and be like, hey, wait, this isn't phishing, this is business email compromise, you know, and being able to discern that. So cognitive biases, really quick. So anchoring, this is where, you know, you get an alert and you have the initial information and someone's like, oh, um, you know, it's just, it's just, uh, you know, them sending something to their personal email, blah, 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 whatever, right? And so you get that initial information and you stay anchored on that information, even though uh, you might be provided additional information that might uh, combat that. So you, you perform your analysis all based on that initial, like, hint or hunch or intuition. And sometimes that's not necessarily... Uh, the best way to do things. And that's a bias as far as your analysis. So a lot of the stuff I read, um, they said, they said awareness of that, of being aware of how you're handling the initial uh, content that's coming in is not necessarily helpful. So what they suggested, if at all possible, is to approach the information kind of like empty mind, where um, you try to set your biases, your assumptions, your perceptions kind of aside and pretend you're looking at it with fresh eyes. And um, the other thing is to slow down when making decisions. Like a lot of times in corporate America, uh, you need to make really fast decisions, and that's not necessarily helpful for analysis. So if you can at all, just 10 seconds, just count 10, 9, 8, 7, just do a really brief countdown, um, and that'll help you with your decision-making process when performing analysis. Another one is confirmation bias. So, um, this one also is kind of similar to the other one, except uh, you go on pre-existing beliefs and hypotheses and you only, you only search for stuff that supports what it is that you believe it to be, if that makes sense. So um, a good way around this that CTI analysts use is analytical thinking model, uh, thinking uh, like structured analytic techniques, which I'll talk about in a little bit, and then also mental models, like different frameworks and stuff. So thinking about thinking is for blue. 
And Richards Hoyer says, analysts should be self-conscious about their reasoning process. And I definitely am. I'm like, oh, gee, <laughs> did, did, I, uh, did I insert too much bias into this? Uh, so I tend to look over it and ask myself a lot of internal questions, kind of like um, if you're really good at introspection, you will be fabulous at uh, this. So how can you be more conscious when you're working with the data? Because the problem is you don't know how serious the alert or situation is until you do. And time is limited, so the executives, manager, director, whomever, they want the information yesterday. But yet, wanting the information yesterday and it not necessarily working with how decision making and analysis works, like how do you compromise? And so I'm suggesting doing this, using the CTI mindset as a technique. So generally in CTI circles, uh, mindsets are kind of not necessarily the best. Um, basically, they're quick to form, but resistant to change. So instead of saying, you must have this mindset, it's more like a hat that you put on and you're like, oh, you know, I'm going to put on my CTI hat for a second and just sit back and kind of observe what my, what my assumptions are and what my biases might be and, um, you know, try to slow down with my thinking and stuff like that. And the thing is with being an analyst, you need to kind of work out your analysis muscles. Like it's not something that just happens overnight and breaking down the problems into easily digestible parts. Um, you know, you're dealing with this alert and these logs and this log and that log and, you know, ah. so um, kind of breaking, like, like it says, like break it down, make it into easily, uh, uh, portioned things that you can actually tackle so it's not overwhelming. The other great suggestion is to get out of your head. So um, decision trees, and this comes directly from the Structured Analytic Techniques book. So if you want detailed information on how to do some of this stuff, I mean, there's like a whole, it's a big book. And they talk about decision trees, diagrams, models, mind maps, lists. Like, um, I know it sounds simple, but honestly, sometimes it's the simple solutions that help and make a huge difference. And also it helps you have conversations with other people. And that's definitely important. And so as Ariana Grande says, break up with your habits. So if I look at a threat intel report and I view it the same way, that, that doesn't necessarily help because I could miss things, if you know what I mean. So I sometimes consult with coworkers. I consult with uh, peers in the industry about questions that I have about things that I'm seeing or not seeing. Um, so I definitely um, rely on other people to help with, uh, with whatever's going on in, in my head, right? The other thing is observing your thoughts. So the easiest way I do this is to just pretend that I'm in a movie theater and I watch my thoughts coming up and I try not to attach any emotion or value to any of those thoughts and I just let them come up and I'm just aware of what it is that I'm thinking as I'm doing the analysis. So I purposefully uh, wrote all of this stuff down because I feel this is an important slide. And these are some questions that you can ask yourself while performing analysis to up your analysis game. So really quick, um, it's it asks, you know, have I been looking for data to disprove the hypothesis? What assumptions am I making? What information am I ignoring? And um, the one that catches me up sometimes. Am I juggling more than seven plus or minus two items? If so, I need to get this out of my head and onto paper or something. So I usually have like my little like notepad up even when I'm doing uh, my doctoral homework, right? Or any of that stuff. I have it up and I just really quick notes, put it down and uh, like a huge relief, huge relief. 
The other thing is make a paper checklist. So everything I read in structured analytic techniques and analysis of competing hypotheses suggests to put something on paper. Um, there were doctors at this hospital and uh, they were suggested to use a checklist and they're like, nah, I'm good. I'm a doctor. I know what I'm doing. And the nurses were like, oh, uh-huh, like we're going to use a checklist. And for every patient, we are going to use this checklist. So by using that checklist, it turned out that it actually saved lives that probably wouldn't have been saved because they would have missed essential steps. So I'm suggesting that if it's good for healthcare and saving lives, writing stuff down in a checklist might actually be helpful for InfoSec too. So brainstorming, uh, you know what that is? Starburst is more like coming up with a gazillion questions for a particular situation. I'm really good at that. Um, and you can do that solo and in a group. Another thing that I added was gestalt therapy. So basically with that, you do role playing. So for instance, um, like if I'm having a hard time, I'll be like, you know, I'll pretend I'm like either my coworker or Katie Nichols or Robert Emily or one of those really awesome people. And like, hmm, what would they tell me? You know, and of course, of course it's total role playing and I'm not, you know, speaking on behalf of them, all of that, right? but sometimes it helps like uh, to leverage that or uh, when developers say the rubber ducky technique. So sometimes just talking out loud to my cat, not really, I better not admit that on a recorded video, but having conversations with people and kind of going over the thought process is just immensely helpful for me. Um, so the other thing is cultures and nation states like, I try not to uh, dabble in that just because my family's from Mexico City and um, I understand that cultural stuff based upon my background. But for instance, if I'm trying to guess what China or Russia or some of those other places that are a little different um, from how I grew up and my understanding of cultural stuff, like I'm not going to try to uh, put myself in, in their shoes. Like there's putting yourself in their shoes and then there's putting yourself in their shoes. and I don't understand some of the nuances because I don't specialize in that. The other suggestion is thinking in graphs and not lists. And uh, Microsoft wrote a great blog on this and I can share that out. Actually, I'll do that right now. In the chat. And then uh, don't for, for, uh, fence yourself in, pick multiple hypotheses. Build evidence for and against your hypotheses. Here's a matrix that you can use, evidence, and then the hypotheses across the top. And basically what you wanna do is attempt to disprove your hypothesis. And how dependent is your conclusion to critical items? Uh, you wanna discuss the likelihood of all hypotheses. And you want to identify clues for events taking a different course than expected. And you know who does a really great job at this? Uh, Dig Digital Shadows did. And um, I'm going to post this in the chat as well. And um, they have an example of ACH that honestly I still look at. It's my inspiration. Uh, so they're really helpful. And I look at that when I want to do uh, ACH. It requires practice. I suggest scenario-based exercises, and uh, that's a really great way to practice and kind of learn how to integrate that into your everyday analysis. I suggest to get a ref for tabletops and to suspend office politics during exercises. And here's Beyonce. Um, sometimes I just imagine what Beyonce would say to my haters, and then everything is perfect again. So uh, yeah, I warned you, I love Beyonce. Um, and then teamwork. So if you work at a toxic place and people aren't willing to work on analysis skills, um, reach out to other blue teamers and other orgs and build that skill set so that you can provide more value to the organization you work for. So to sum up, think about thinking, to up your analysis game, use a CTI mindset as a technique, uh, ask yourself questions when performing analysis, 
and uh, attempt to disprove your hypothesis instead of trying to prove it. And finally, practice, practice, practice. So here's the main takeaways uh, from this presentation. Thank you so much uh, for attending my talk and you can DM me and I will be happy to answer questions. Thank you very much.